So now I have to do this. I have a ball and chain now. All right, Toastmasters is an international program, and we are only one small chapter, but we want to invite you to be part of our chapter and in join us for any of our meetings. We meet the second and fourth Thursday of every month. There are some informations on the back table, so if you want to speak to any of us about that, we'd be happy to do that. Now, I want to start the evening. I am not going to be the moderator. That will be adeptly handled by Greg. And we want your full attention because we know that all of you will be exercising your mind tonight, right? Please help me welcome Greg. Hello everyone and uh, welcome to tonight's debate. Uh, my name is Greg Andrade and I will be your moderator for this evening. Uh, this is the start of a debate series that will be sponsored by the Christian Focus Toastmasters Club and also by Backyard Skeptics, an atheist group in Orange County. And although this uh, introductory kickoff debate does not uh, cover an official subject other than Christianity versus atheism, uh, future debates will have a topic selected uh, in alternation by each side and also a moderator that will be selected uh, alternately by each side. Uh, these debates are meant to provide an open discussion uh, of the difficulties of understanding two entirely different worldviews. And uh, although Christianity is overwhelmingly popular in the United States, uh, there are some interesting trends in American culture. Uh, recent surveys indicate that as many as 30, uh, 20% of Americans are non-believers or self-report as not having uh, religious beliefs. And if you ask Americans under the age of 30, that figure rises to as high as 30%. So there's some interesting trends on that front. But on the side of religiosity, 48% of Americans believe that God made humans in their current form uh, without resorting to evolution or any evolutionary processes taking place. And only 15% believe that human beings evolved over millions of years uh, from less advanced forms of life uh, without God having any guidance or say in the process. So clearly there are some competing views out there and these debates are designed in part to explore those differences and to examine uh, how they color people's approaches and views to particular issues. Now, those in the room uh, who are here or those uh, watching or listening at home and uh, may have friends or, or family that you'd like to let know about this debate or others, uh, please keep in mind that this is being streamed on the BackyardSkeptics.com website. So feel free uh, to text or engage <coughs> in social media and let other people know about these debates and the whole series. Again, they're streamed on BackyardSkeptics.com. But that does bring me to a very important point at this stage, please make sure that you've silenced uh, your cell phones or any other electronic devices, so hopefully we can proceed to a nice uh, silence here and out of respect for our participants. I just want to cover our debate structure, which is pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, we're going to begin with opening statements, and each side will have an opportunity to make statements. Uh, on the Christian side, we'll have uh, one participant uh, who will be giving a single opening statement. And on the atheist side, we'll have a statement from each of our participants. Then we'll move into a questions phase. And each side will have an opportunity to pose a question to the other, in fact, two <coughs> questions to the other without rebuttal. Then we'll move right into our conversation time. And that's where we'll have an opportunity to debate and discuss those questions and the issues they raise. Uh, finally, we'll move into closing statements, and again, each side will have representatives. On the Christian side, there'll be a single representative giving a closing statement, and on the atheist side, we'll have a pair of closing statements. Uh, after that, we'll move into the question and answer phase, and that's where you folks here in the audience have an opportunity to uh, take part in the proceedings and ask questions of our participants. Now. Before I get into the introductions, let's take the temperature of the room, so to speak. How many here will describe themselves as Christians? Of one kind of another. Of one sort or another, you sure? Okay. And how many here would describe themselves as atheists or non-believers? 
maybe, maybe a 60-40 split or so. So a pretty healthy turnout from both sides, which is good for, for a discussion of this nature. Now I'd like to introduce our participants and then move quickly to our opening statements. Let's start with the Christian side. We have David Lehman. Dr. Lehman has a BME from the University of Minnesota, a Master of Divinity from Grace Seminary, a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Oxford Graduate School in Tennessee, and a PhD from Louisiana Baptist University. Uh, he lectures at churches, <coughs> conferences, and university campuses on creationism, cults, and evidence for Christian faith. Also on the Christian side, we have Douglas Hamp. He's the author of several works, including Discovering the Language of Jesus, The First Six Days, and Corrupting the Image. And he earned his MA in uh, the Hebrew Bible and its world from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And you can find uh, Doug online at douglashamp.com. That's D-O-U-G-L-A-S-H-A-M-P.com. On the atheist side, we have Bruce Gleason. Bruce is the director of Free Thought Alliance and the founder and organizer of the largest regional atheist meetup group in the area, Backyard Skeptics, which has over 1,000 members. Bruce is also the producer and director of the Orange County Atheist Cable TV Show. And then next we have Bill Zersher, also on the atheist side. Bill studied economics and government at Yale University, and after several decades in the oil industry, he retired to pursue an interest in teaching. He and his wife live in Laguna Niguel, where he teaches math and also writes on the side. <coughs> so thank you, gentlemen, for participating in this debate. Thank you all for attending. Let's go ahead and move into our opening statements, and where we're going to begin with David Lehman, and he's going to talk with us for about 15 minutes. I think we'll change on that. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. Bruce is going to kick this off. Bruce will have about seven and a half minutes, and then I think we're turning to David and then back to Bill. If you didn't catch that, Dave's going to be taking all of the 15 minutes of the opening statement and then uh, Doug will be following up at the closing statement with the equivalent time of both of us, so we're kind of spreading out uh, equally. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I enjoy debates. Do you enjoy debates? Yeah. I think this is, this is a great, great time. I really want to thank uh, Dave, uh, Dave and Doug for coming, and uh, actually Dave was the one who invited us, so yay for Dave. And I don't know if you know, but Dave and I actually have a social affair. We're both West Coast swing dancers, so we see each other at West Coast swing events. I met him. Initially at a West Coast swing event in Anaheim, great guy, like the guy, a little odd in my particular opinion, but I'm sure he probably <laughs> thinks the same thing of me. So, so now we're going to start with the screen. I don't know, uh, we were going to try to, uh, the first time we've been here, we didn't uh, preview the room, so if anybody can't see the, um, the screen, I apologize. Uh, I'd like to talk about the basics and get some definitions out of the way, and then I'll get into some ideas and some other things we might be able to talk about later. The first one is... I am an atheist. Is it working? There it is. I am an atheist. What does an atheist mean? What do they believe? Do they believe in anything? Well, if you take that we don't believe in a god or any deity, and everything else that we believe is pretty much equal. So we believe in a lot of things, just like most everybody in the world, but we don't believe in a deity. That doesn't mean that we think a deity, that we, uh, we say a deity doesn't exist. We don't say that. That's a, a different type of, of atheist altogether. And, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about agnosticism. Agnosticism is about knowledge. Atheism and theism is about belief. Personally, I'm an a, a agnostic atheist because I don't know. I don't think Doug or Dave knows. I don't think anybody knows the absolute truth. I think that a solid description of how you believe is a good thing. Some people don't want to be categorized or pigeonholed. I think it's a good thing because it knows, it lets people know who you are and it can identify with them. I'd like to know later on why, I'm going to back up a little bit. What would it take to change my mind as an atheist? Well, it'd be easy. I can change my mind very, very simply if God just simply moved a couple dozen stars in the sky several hundred light years instantaneously, that would get me on a good start. Something supernatural, something that can't be explained naturally. That would do it for me. Now, I'm, I have to ask, would, how would Doug and Dave change their minds? Do they have absolute knowledge? Are they dogma-ridden? 
is there any place there to say that they might be wrong? Because I can say, for a fact, I could be wrong. But it's about one piece of sand in the entire beaches of the world that I think that I'm wrong. I still could be proven, though, proven wrong. So belief does not equal knowledge. No matter how much one believes, it does not mean that they know what they believe. Even if one so strongly feels it in their bones, it does not have anything to do with knowledge. So when somebody says, I know God, they believe. They believe extremely strongly, but they don't know if God exists. They believe that God exists. When they say they know that God exists, it's just their strong feelings, but technically it has to be proven evidence, not anecdotal personal evidence, but real evidence. Although feelings are real, they can be invalidated very easily. It's not a good judge of what is real by how you feel. That doesn't mean I don't love my wife, I feel my wife, I love my wife very much. And that is real and I can prove that she loves me as well. Why atheists? I'm going to go ahead and to go to, a, I skipped a couple screens, I apologize, so we're going to zip through here. Go ahead, Bill, back a little bit. What is an atheist? Uh, that's the number of atheists in the U.S., 21 million. Now, they don't call themselves atheists, they're part of the nuns, but they act as if they're atheists. So we are at least 20% of the population, 30% of those under 30. Next, Dave? Or, excuse me, Bill? Uh, that's going... That's going uh, forward, now I'm going back. There you go, keep on going. Second one? Oh, keep on going, to the right, there you go. To the right one more, to the right one more. And I think that I'm in a loop here. I'm gonna have to wing it. Ah, one more, keep on going, let's see what happens. Ah, here we go, one more. That was the Dave and Doug, that's the universe, one more. One more, that's the light thing. Ah, okay, I'm gonna skip that one, one more. This is about truth and beliefs, knowledge is in the middle. One more, I really blew this one, and this is about feelings, so I tried to add some little humor in there. I don't know if I, if I got it in time, and now since I blew my PowerPoint. Okay, go ahead, one more, okay. <clears throat> Why are atheists think that they live in a world that is better than compared to other Christians? Go ahead into the next one, please. This is a graph of, you know, I'm going to skip this for now because I'm not in control and it's, it's very tough. So I'm going to skip it for now. Follow me along, Bill. Just read the graphs if you can, okay? We can measure societal health. And if we compare other countries, we can see that most atheistic countries have better societal health. We're talking about infant mortality, low homophobia, women's rights, free education, a less of a glass ceiling for women, low murder rates, low pregnancy and abortion rates, low obesity, I think that's in there somewhere. That's pretty good, Bill, you're keeping up very well. <laughs> Nearly every measure of societal health is best among atheist populations in the world. So you have to ask, why is God rewarding the atheistic countries? You gotta ask that. Now the prison population, this is a really good one. See that little tiny sliver at the top? That's 0.2% of atheists in prisons. Compared to what? How many Christians? 75%. Just about the amount that's in the general public. Remember I said there were 21 million atheists? 20%? This is 100 times less in prisons. I want to talk a little bit about morality tonight, and that's one of the graphs I'm going to be using. So next one, we're going to go. There's a couple things we might touch on tonight. That's uh, God rewarding the atheistic countries. And this one is interesting because there has never been in the world an atheist that has risen, risen the atheist flag and killed other people for being religious. Yes, there were Stalin and Pol Pot, but they did not raise an atheist flag. They, read, they raised their own political dogma flag. But nowhere in the world can you see this. This is one th reason why I'm an atheist. One more thing, God and the devil. Uh, next one. Oh, Pascal's wager. I got those reversed. Next one, please. Okay. How do we find out what the truth is? Dave and I and Doug and I are actually truth seekers. It's just that our truth, meaning my truth, comes from reason, facts, and knowledge that is based in reality, and the religionist truths 
come from supposedly a supernatural inspired book written 2,000 years ago that I think should belong in a museum. Next one. Next one. And that's the devil. I'm still following up here, guys. Truth. Okay, one more. Okay, that's right. Dave, Doug, and Bill and I are not professional scientists. So how can we tell if something is true in the world? We ask the, exper ex uh, we ask the experts. We know that cell phones don't give us cancer because of the experts. We know that cancer drugs have a worthwhile effect on cancer, pa cancer patients because of the experts. We know that the brakes in our car will work because of the experts. The reason we know this is because there is an overwhelmingly consensus with each narrow field of study that agrees on one particular fact. And most of us trust that the consensus is true until other data comes along and supports more evidence and it outweighs the pre-existing evidence. I am on the red right now. I had two more paragraphs to go, so I'm going to have to make it up later. And now I think it's Doug's turn. Uh, Dave's turn. Excuse me. Okay. Actually, atheists are just better at not getting caught. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, touche, touche, Dave. And I appreciate the opportunity that we have to get together and just share these things. As I look around and I see the animals, the trees, the flowers, the sun, the moon, the stars, the people, I can know something about the Creator, but from the creation, He that created. Uh, Everybody is telling me I'm not speaking loud enough. Uh, as I, so, um, is this, oh, okay, very good. So, um, I look around and I see these uh, animals, the trees, the flowers, the sun, the moon, the stars, the people, and I can know something about the creator from the creation. He that formed the eye, does he not see? He that created the ear, does he not hear? We have a personality, therefore we'd expect the creator to have a personality as well. The cause is usually greater than the effect. But for answers to questions like, who am I? Am I just an intelligent animal or do I have a soul? What about life after death? How should I use my time and my talents? And what does God require from me? If he went to the trouble to create us, obviously he's going to want us to know what he requires of us. But where's that information found and how can I be sure that it's from God? And so I look throughout the gamut of literature available to us as humans, and I find one book that passes the test required to be the Word of God, and I believe that's the Bible. And the four tests that I would give are inspiration, inerrancy, preservation, and illumination. Inspiration comes from the Greek word theopneustos, literally means God breathed or God directed. It's like a master musician playing a piano. Each one of the keys on the piano has a different sound, just like each one of the apostles and prophets had a different personality, but God superintended the finished product so that it was without error. And of course it would have to be without error, otherwise I'd need a red letter edition to tell me what's true, what to teach my children if I had any, what to send my missionaries out with. And of course we don't have that. 3,408 times in the Bible it claims to be the Word of God. Thus saith the Lord, the Lord spoke saying, you accepted these not as the words of man, but for what they really are, the Word of God. And then it makes a challenge to all the other religious writings in the world. Isaiah 43, 10, 44, 45, and 46, it makes this statement over and over in different words. It says, I, the Lord, am one God. There's none else beside me, before me, or that should come after me who's able to tell the end from the beginning. So if God's in charge, he's going to be able to tell the future. Nobody else can do that. And, of course, we find that 28.5% of the Old Testament and 21.5% of the New Testament is prophetic. And we go through all the different cities, Tyre, Sidon, Memphis, Thebes. Uh, I've just got a whole list of, of cities and each one would take about 15, 20 minutes to describe the details of the prophecy and then how it was fulfilled. We look at Tyre, we see that there were seven things that were going to happen to the city of Tyre, going to be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, others would participate in its destruction, that it would, the rubble would be scraped into the sea, it would become the place for the spreading of fishermen's nets, and it would never be rebuilt again, and those are exactly the things that happened to the city of Tyre. And of course we could go through each one of these cities and see that kind of detail. It's really kind of interesting to see how the exact description in scripture has been fulfilled. We know when these things were written. One fellow, Peter Stoner, who was head of the math department at Westmont College, uh, taught statistics and he said, what's the probability that just, you know, uh, some of these things would happen? And so he finally came down to the Messiah. How many prophecies are there in the Old Testament concerning the coming Messiah? Of course, he said there's about 300. There's actually about 456 prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the Messiah. 
And he said, what's the probability of just eight of those things happening in the life of any one person? For example, that he'd be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2, that he'd be sold for 30 pieces of silver, that it would be used to buy a potter's field and cast onto the temple floor, that he'd be crucified, be cru crucified between two thieves, that his garments would be cast lots for. He said, just take eight of those prophecies and it would be, be the same as taking, spreading silver dollars over the state of Texas, two feet high, marking one, mixing them up and have a blindfold, the guy picked the right one the first time. He says, what's the probability of 48 of those things happening in the life of any one person? He says, that's the same as taking electrons, cramming them one up against another. It would take you 19 million years to count a line one inch long at the rate of 250 a minute. So to count a cubic inch, it would take you 19 million years times 19 million years times 19 million years just to count them. Start at the center of the Earth, go 6 billion light years in radius, create these balls of electrons, 6 billion light years in radius at the rate of 500 a minute. For 6 billion years, it would be 10 to the 10th times that. Mark one, mix them up and have a blindfold. A guy pick the right one the first time, and that's just 48 prophecies and we're talking about several hundred. There's no prophecies concerning Buddha before he came, no prophecies concerning Muhammad before he came, no prophecies concerning Joseph Smith, Charles Hayes Ruther, the founder of any other cult or world religion before they came. Christianity is unique. And so we see that God has given, and then the next thing I would ask is, well, how do I know that what we have today is what was written down by the early apostles and prophets? Well, we could take the Old Testament, or we could just take the New Testament, for example, we have about 24,500 existing manuscripts. We've got 5,400 Greek manuscripts. And I was talking to Gleason Archer, who probably one of the leading textual critics in the world. He spoke 29 languages, because I'd ask him about Ugaritic. Oh, that's right, I teach that every other year. But he said it's interesting that there's only, and he's not the only one that said this, there's only 400 words in the entire New Testament that there's any question about at all. And he says, this is what he told me, it was, I was talking to him on the phone one Sunday night, he said, it's as if God inspired the variants because the variants do not change the meaning or the doctrine in any way. So for all practical purposes, we have the original autographs. So we got a 99.5% accuracy of the original words of the text, and the words that we're not sure of don't change anything. So this is what we call preservation. In Isaiah 40, verse 8, it says, the grass withers and the flower fades, but my word shall endure forever. In other words, God's promised to keep it together, and this is how we know, just simply by the sheer number. If we had just one copy, we would know what percentage accuracy we're dealing with. And then we have the last one is kind of this idea of the illumination. There's something about the Bible that speaks to the heart of man like no other book. So many people have become Christians without any outside influence just reading their Bible. It's nice to have it in your own language. But uh, then we look at the creation itself. His invisible power and attributes are clearly seen by the things that are made so that they're without excuse. And I think there's three testimonies that we have, every one of us. We have the, his conscience, his spirit, the, the, God's, the, the light that lighteth every man that comes into the world. Job talks about eternity in their hearts. We all seem to think that there is, there is more to life than just what, we, what we're experiencing right now. There is the testimony of the creation itself, the detail, the complexity of creation. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. The firmament declares his handiwork. We can just look at the human body, the eye, with over 10 million photoreceptor cells in the back. Each one of those photoreceptor cells can perform the equivalent of 500 nonlinear simultaneous differential equations 100 times a millisecond. When you consider that there's 10 million of them interacting with each other in complex ways, it would take a crazy supercomputer over 100 years to simulate what takes place in the back of your eye many times every second. The ear in the cochlea duct has three outer layers and one inner layer of hair cells. These hair cells have a little trap door uh, uh, that can open and close. This is a, this is a spring cell over 20,000 times a second. Your ear has a dampening mechanism so that you can stand next to an airplane taking off or you can hear a pin drop. But it takes a little time. So if you have somebody shoot a bullet right off a, a gun right next to you, you could actually do some damage. But your ear will adjust. It's an amazing, complex thing. I was talking to one of my Muslim friends, and he said, well, whoever created the ear must have known about hearing in order to create an instrument so precisely designed for that purpose alone. So I think there's only two possible worldviews. Either there's a theistic explanation for things or a non-theistic. Either God did it or he didn't. Either it happened naturally or supernaturally. So if you disprove one, I think you prove the other. I don't think there's any other options. Well, as I look at these evidence, I start to so well, where do we come from? In fact, that's a question that we always want to know. One of my professors at Grace Seminary, actually he was president of the school, said there's two things that determine how a person will respond in this life. One, where they think they came from and where they think they're going. 
And so we kind of study the creation and we kind of study prophecy. We try to understand what is the future? What does, what does God have in store for us? And we'd like to know. Most people would like to know what's going to happen. Um, I kind of enjoy studying the cosmophysicists. They have a uh, never-changing kaleidoscope of quantum fluctuations of nothing into everything, cosmic inflation, multiple universes, ten-dimensional spaces, effects without causes, black holes, universes reproducing themselves, cold dark matter, ordered systems out of chaotic explosions, hyperstrings, antimatter, loops of time, all kinds of these wonderful things generated by higher mathematics. And they come up with some interesting <coughs> concepts. The Copenhagen interpretation one is that there is no deep reality. This is quantum physics. Reality is created by observation, so the moon is demonstrably not there if no one looks. Reality is undivided wholeness. Reality consists of steadily increasing number of parallel universes. The world obeys some kind of non-human reasoning, so really there's no way we could know. Or consciousness, consciousness creates reality. So this kind of leads us to the idea that our universe is simply one of those things that happens from time to time. So in other words, a tiny bit of nothing is packed together so tightly it blew up and it created everything that we see. That's the concept basically behind the Big Bang Theory. First of all, nothing just can't pack itself together. There's no way to push itself into a pile. Second, a vacuum has no density. It said that nothing just got very dense and that's why it exploded, but a total vacuum is the opposite of total density. Third, there can't be any ignition to explode the nothing. There's no fire, no match. It couldn't be a chemical explosion, for there are no chemicals. It couldn't be a nuclear explosion. There were no atoms. Fourth, there's no way to expand it. How can you expand what isn't there? Even if that magical vacuum could somehow be pulled together by gravity, what would then cause the pile of emptiness to push out? The gravity that caused it to come together would keep it from expanding. Fifth, nothingness can't produce heat. The intense heat caused by the exploding nothingness is supposed to have changed the nothingness into protons, neutrons, and electrons. First, the empty vacuum in the extreme cold of outer space couldn't get hot by itself. Second, an empty void couldn't magically change itself into matter. Third, there can't be any heat without an energy source. And then we have the problem with this proteins. Where did protein and DNA come from? Sagan called this a biological treadmill because in order to form DNA, you can't form or even exist without pre-existing proteins. Sagan called this, this idea, something he called it a biological treadmill. If both sufficient DNA to code 124 proteins and sufficient protein, 124, to house and catalyze the DNA independently evolved and sufficiently associated, subsequently associated themselves to, to create the first living entity. The individual probabilities must be multiplied. There's a guy that wrote a book, Wysong, and in it, I tried to follow his, his uh, reasoning pretty carefully, and it is interesting. He comes up with the fact that it would be over, you'd have one over, the total probability would be one over 10 to the 89,190th power. That's the probability of forming DNA times one over 10 to the 78,436 power, the probability of forming 124 proteins. You multiply that together, which you mean to add the exponents, it's one over 10 to the 167,626 power, assuming one million Earths around every star in the universe and every single amino acid was trying to form a protein. Now, you can only cram 10 to the 130th power electrons in their own universe. So despite the virtually impossible odds, proteins arose by chance processes. There's not the least remotest reason to believe that they could ever form a membrane encased, self-reproducing, self-repairing, metabolizing living cell. That's a, a jump in complexity that nobody has ever been even to imagine. That's what caused Michael Behe, who wrote Darwin's Black Box. I mean, here is a, pretty much a secular cell biologist saying there is just no way that this could happen. Excellent book. So then we have this uh, living technology, technology that is so completely complex. Uh, we, 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 we want to find out how to do stuff. We kind of watch some of the animals. We try to figure out how to create self-sharpening self blades and we look at the rat and we see that just the right angle to sharpen its teeth as it cuts. We look at metamorphosis, 87% of insects have some kind of form of metamorphosis. And for example, the monarch butterfly, after two weeks, it eats uh, milkweed continuously. And then eventually, it, about two weeks later, it forms a chrysalis. All of its bodily organs, its brain, dissolve into this gray mush. And two weeks later, it comes out as a beautiful monarch butterfly that can navigate 3,000 miles with a brain the size of a head of a pin. Now, how did this actually evolve? What caused this process? I think the codes have to be there in the initially. It's not something that would happen gradually. 
that is one of the problems because the idea of uniformitarianism that this thing, this happened gradually, is been rejected by more than 50 percent, at last I heard, of the scientists. Charles Lyell came up with the idea of uniformitarianism, and Darwin even said if it can't be done in small incremental steps, his theory would totally break down. But Stephen Gould, Stephen Stanley, Niles Eldridge, and several others became punctuationists where they said, well, every 50,000 years we're going to have to have several million mutations all of a sudden. Well, I asked Jerry Bergman at the last, well, this was five years ago, at the International Creation Conference. And I asked him, I said, now here's a guy with four earned doctorates and nine master's degrees. I asked him, has anybody ever seen a positive mutation? Because I had just downloaded Mendel's accountant onto my laptop. It took several hours to do that. And he said, well, according to Mendel's accountant, it'd take a billion positive mutations to get an assant organ, a new organ of some kind. But not only do you have to get the new organ, you have to locate it in the right part of the body. Then you not only have to locate it in the right place, because, or you'd have to connect it to all other, other bodily organs all through a random process. So I asked him, has anybody ever seen a positive mutation? And he said, wait till the rest of them get here. So we have 200 leading scientists from all over the world crammed into this room. And I asked Jerry, has anybody ever seen a positive mutation? He said, nobody's ever documented a single positive mutation. But I need a billion of them to make this thing work, to get a, you know. And it has to all affect the, part of the same part of the body. And they, they can't, if you get a negative one, you might have to start all over again. So it seems very difficult for anybody to imagine how this could happen naturally. So I would just say, as Dr. Ernest Meyer from Harvard said, mutations provide the only mechanism that would cause evolution to occur at all. So with that, I'll close. This is uh, Bill Zersher. I don't believe in the existence of any <coughs> gods or goddesses. It is certainly possible uh, that one or more of such beings exist. Uh, but if so, they do not appear to expend much effort in superintending the affairs of this world. I see a lot of evidence uh, for the existence of a natural world, one filled with rocks and trees and people. I see no evidence for the existence of a supernatural world. Thank you one filled with gods, goddesses, spirits, and souls. I cannot prove that there are no gods or goddesses, but then Dave cannot prove that there are no leprechauns. Neither of our beliefs are matters of certainty, they are simply matters of weighing the evidence. If a supernatural realm existed and any one of its occupants wished to make his presence known to me, I assume he would be successful. This is particularly true for any of the monotheistic gods who are allegedly all-powerful and infinitely resourceful. If such a deity wanted me to know something, I would know it, period. In discussions like these, two questions always come up, so I thought I'd address them at the outset. These questions are about the origins of the universe and of morality. There's the universe. Uh, where did it come from? No one knows the answer to that question. For those of you who are hoping for a major announcement tonight, Sorry to be disappointed. Uh, what we do know is that for as long as there have been human beings, they have been inventing gods and goddesses to explain the origins of things. Just about every culture has a creation story. Christians content themselves with the Jewish creation story in Genesis. Compare that story with the creation story of the Native American Iroquois. Twin sons of the sky people created the world. One twin, named Sapling, created all the good things including useful plants and animals. The other twin named Flint created harmful animals, put thorns on plants, and created winter. Eventually the twins fought, sapling one, but the influence of Flint persists. There are no good reasons for believing that either the Israelite story in Genesis or the Iroquois story is more historically accurate than the other. The fact is that we do not yet understand the origins of the universe and as grown-ups must live with this uncertainty. The second question, morality. I'd like to compare two different approaches, a Christian and a secular. The Christian approach is built on three assumptions. Number one, a God exists and he cares about our behavior. Number two, morality is what this God says it is. And number three, humans are able to understand his instructions. I believe all three of these assumptions are flawed 
And I hope that during the discussion to come, we have time to go into that. Uh, by contrast, the secular approach is built upon two assumptions. First, morality can be defined as behavior which aims to increase well-being and reduce suffering. This is what most people actually mean when they use the term morality, at least outside of a religious context. And the second assumption, through reason and empathy, humans are able to determine or at least approximate what increases well-being or reduces suffering. Humans possess morality because they have the capacity to understand cause and effect and to empathize. Individuals do not want to suffer, and through reason and empathy, they can generalize that to others. Again, I believe the secular is the uh, superior of the two approaches, and time permitting, we can go into why. Uh, moving to other issues within tonight's preposterously broad subject, uh, my objections to Christianity are too numerous to summarize in this short time. I can, however, categorize them. Uh, my contention is that Christianity is arbitrary, it has been disconfirmed, it is man-made, it is illogical, and it is immoral. I have arbitrary listed first because from it flow many of the other problems. Christianity teaches that its followers must possess a thing called faith, uh, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. In other words, faith means accepting that something is true despite insufficient grounds for, belie for believing it to be so. Faith replaces the customary reason for holding a belief, namely evidence and reason, with a mere desire to believe it. By definition, then, faith is arbitrary. Precisely because it does not require evidence, a person could have faith in anything, and his faith would be just as legitimate as anybody else's. People can, and do, have faith in the Hindu god Vishnu, or the Yoruban high god Alorum, just as fervently as they do in the Middle Eastern god Jesus. What determines a person's faith? Despite the large number of religions in the world to choose from, most people in any one place tend to follow the same religion or family of religions. This demonstrates that faith is generally not an individual decision, but rather the result of social conditioning. The religion people consider to be true is determined by the arbitrary accident of where they grew up. If my Christian friends in this room had been raised in Indonesia or China, most would have faith in what some other group of men told them. Would anyone here be persuaded if a 2,000-year-old Cambodian tradition said that a certain medicine man was divine and that you would be punished in another life if you failed to believe it in this one? These are arbitrary allegiances and as such are not something to be celebrated. The dominant role played by faith in Western civilization has gone so long unchallenged that few people see the perversity of complimenting someone by saying, he's a man of faith, as if believing things without sufficient evidence were a commendable trait in a human being. Thank you everyone for attending tonight. I hope the ideas shared here tonight make your trip worthwhile. Thank you for your opening statements. Uh, next we want to move into the opportunity to pose two questions to the other without rebuttal. And we're going to start. Any particular side? You choose. Anyone want to volunteer? Uh, how about we start with the Christian side? Okay. And, and may I ask uh, that you move the podium back so we can see each other? Sure. Right. Good. Are you going to ask a question, Dave? We're both trying to figure out a question to ask you guys. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, be spontaneous. You want me to go first while you uh, think sure. about it? There you go. Okay. My question is this. Genesis. 115. Do you believe the moon emits light as some conservative Christians do? Oh, you don't have to do the microphone. It's going to break. Yeah, right on the table, right? That's fine. Okay. Uh, it reflects light, sure. So, just like a mirror emits light, it's reflecting it. I mean, it's obviously not producing its own light, but it is reflecting light. Just like if we were to shine something on this screen right here. If we were to... Oh, I guess, I guess the microphone will be used for the speaker. Okay. 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 Sorry, there we go. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so the, the moon does reflect light just as if we were to project something up onto this screen, it's going to reflect light. And if you want to call that an emission of light, I mean, maybe that's not technically correct. 
I don't believe that the text says that it emits light, but it is, uh, it is a light for the night. Uh, would you like to go with the next question and then Bill will have his time? Sure. Okay. Well, um, you know, first of all, uh, <clears throat> 21 million people is not exactly 20% of American population. That's about 7%. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, get you correct on your math there. I don't want to take that by faith. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, you asked what would it take to change you. And I, I think we can all agree that it's not about the evidence because there is a lot of evidence, and I've known you for some time, and I know that you go to a lot of creation events, uh, probably more than I actually happen to attend. Uh, you were at the ICR conference this past weekend. Um, so you've heard the evidence. I suspect that it's not really about, it's not about all of the scientific evidence. Is there something else that really offends you about the God of, of the Bible? Oh, oh, wow, that's an easy one. Yes, of course. Yes. Well, hang on. I want to step in here because okay. we weren't going to have rebuttals as part of this. So we'll, we'll, we want to pose those questions right. and then get into the discussion right. no about rebuttal. them. So let's keep that in mind. So to you, Bruce, is there something that sort of offends you uh, from oh, the other side? Goodness. So we'll you make note of a, that. You touched on a great <laughs> nerve there. If uh, something that one person believes is so strong that it's your... Admo you're not admonished to discover anything more about that one thing. You, if, you, if you say in the Bible, don't ask questions. Just believe because that's faith. That doesn't get us anywhere in the world. The last 150 years, the only thing that has improved longevity, remember we used to only uh, live until 40 to 42 years old 150 years ago. That was the average. The only thing that has helped us live twice that long is science. So much more, so much more. We'll get into that later, Doug. Yep. And I feel like oh, you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, according to Leviticus 25:44, uh, you may buy male and female slaves from the nations that are around you. Um, this is a very clear endorsement of slavery, and there are others, you know, passages that prohibit kidnapping or require slaves to be freed after seven years, refer to the treatment of fellow Israelites, not people from other nations. Uh, the New Testament, of course, uh, repeats this message, Ephesians 6.5, Colossians 3.22, 1 Timothy 6, 1 Peter 2. So if Christians are true to their belief that morality comes from God and that the Bible is God's word, uh, isn't it necessary that you endorse slavery? Am I supposed to answer that? Uh, why don't we try, I'm going to try to keep this in order according to our original plan. Why don't you, uh, you go ahead and present a question and then let's start answering the questions that have been raised when we move into the discussion time. Make sense? That was sort of the original well, that, idea. That was his question though. Yeah, that's, that, so. that was his question. But we want to save that for the discussion period. So we want to start with our, our two questions from each side without rebuttal. And then we'll move into actually discussing the answers to them. Fair, oh, fair enough? Okay. okay. I misunderstood. Sure. My own rules. <laughs> so, uh, let, let's go ahead, David. Uh, do you have a, a question you'd like to pose? Why, and I, I'm asking both of you, uh, probably mainly Bruce, but both of you, why would anybody be an evangelist for non-belief? What do you, would you possibly gain if there's no afterlife? Why not just let everybody have a good time and join them? Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and let the discussion unfold here uh, based on uh, those questions. I think you gentlemen can sort out if there are any particular ones you'd like to tackle first. Among those, again, we had the question already partially responded to on uh, whether the moon emits light uh, and then uh, what offends Bruce, particularly about the other side. We also have our latest question here about why would anyone be an evangelist for non-belief and, of course, Bill's question about the endorsement of slavery uh, in particular in the uh, Hebrew Bible. Well, um, <clears throat> okay, well, I think that we ought to start. Uh, the, the question were meant as a Kickstarter to start a discussion 
between us four because we did not have a particular topic on tonight's subject. So let's talk about the questions that just arose. And um, you go first, then we'll move on into other things. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, you said that the Bible says don't ask questions. You're just supposed to have faith. I haven't seen that verse. In fact, last time I checked, some of the greatest scientists ever, uh, Newton, for example, uh, he was a Christian. He wrote a commentary in the book of Daniel. And he figured that he was actually <coughs> discovering God's handiwork. He was uh, trying to figure out how God did things. So he started with a theistic premise that there is a God, that God is the one who not only wound things up, but is actively involved in this world. And he's just trying to understand how God did things. So I, I, I think it's somewhat spurious to say that as Christians, we're not supposed to ask questions. In fact, uh, now it, it may be church dogma that we're not supposed to ask questions because we do know there was a, a a long period of time, an unfortunate period of time, when the Catholic Church, which had really nothing to do with the God of the Bible, uh, was burning people at the stake for asking the wrong questions. So there, there is something to that. But as uh, if, you, if you go into a, a Jewish synagogue, for example, you'll find that when they're studying the Bible, it's pretty noisy. Uh, you go into what's called a Beit Midrash, and people are studying the Bible by asking each other questions. And they're saying, really, is that so? In fact, we see the model of this in the Bible itself. God declared that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for all of the wickedness they were doing. And Abraham had the audacity to ask, well, what, what if there are 50 righteous people there? All right, if you can find 50, I won't. What about 40, 30, 20, down to 10? So he had the audacity to ask God a question. And God didn't zap him for doing it. In fact, he was actually rewarded God was very pleased in this man of faith. Uh, he was actually demonstrating uh, faith that talking to the Almighty who wasn't going to get zapped uh, just for, for speaking out. If you also look at Moses, he interceded for the children of Israel and, and it's, it's almost kind of humorous. Uh, God says, look, the, the people that you took out of uh, Egypt take them. And, and Moses says, no, 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 they're the, the people that you took out. And there's this little banter going back and forth. You see, so Moses is, is really, uh, he's, he's asking God questions. He's actually uh, countering something that God is saying. It's not just, you know, God has said it, therefore I have to cower and just totally accept it. No, there are things that, that are so, and they're not going to change no yeah, matter like what I think about it. Pardon? Yeah, I'd like to respond to that. Go ahead. We're going back and forth here, right, Doug? Absolutely. Okay. Do you think that Newton would have uh, discovered gravity if he didn't believe in God? I think he would have. Now, okay. about the moon, it does say emit, by the way. I looked up the Greek word. Okay, it's Hebrew, though. That's, that's right. <laughs> Very good. Good job, Doug. The, the, New Testament's, the New Testament's Greek, and the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures are written in Hebrew. <laughs> well, the Septuagint uh, is a translation. Oh, that's, I stand corrected. Very good. Very good. I said corrected. Um, I'd like to respond about... Uh, well, let's, let's give uh, Bill and Dave a chance. Bill, would you like to respond to any questions? I'll just respond briefly to the uh, non-believer evangelism question. I think really Bruce touched on this point earlier when he showed uh, the slides. When you look at the countries in the world that are the most atheistic, uh, agnostic, secular, particularly the Scandinavian countries and Japan, uh, they at the top of the charts in virtually every measure of societal health, infant mortality, life expectancy, uh, gender equality, uh, fewest number of homicides, etc. Uh, to me, this is a pretty strong indicator um, that religion, which emphasizes uh, faith and doesn't emphasize thinking for yourself, uh, is, is not the best way to organize a society. Uh, and I guess what motivates me to be involved in discussions like this is that uh, I'm involved in teaching, and uh, when I see uh, attempts to teach intelligent uh, design uh, surreptitiously inserted into high school biology curriculum, uh, I get concerned, very concerned about the future of our country, its competitiveness, uh, and its very coherence. like 
to respond to that. Uh, we talk about the atrocities, for example, in the Old Testament and in the countries. Uh, microphone, microphone. Is this uh, not on? Well, you're no, not. He'll turn it up. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, you read the Old Testament and you see God's commanding the destruction of Sodom, the annihilation of the Canaanites, the flood, etc. Um, yet God says, have I pleasure in the death of the wicked and not rather that he should turn from his way and live, Ezekiel 18, 23. In the case of the Amorites, God gave them hundreds of years to repent, but they didn't. And Noah preached to a generation for 120 years before the flood. Jesus himself declared the Old Testament to be summed up in the commandments, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and thy neighbors thyself. But atheists claim that religion is evil as and cannot be from God. It's true that there are many examples of evil committed in the name of Christianity, in the name of religion. In the past, those who disagreed with official church doctrine, such as Galileo, were persecuted or killed. Many other Christians were brought before the Inquisition because they were teaching from the Bible instead of the official sanction. Roman Catholic Church materials. In addition, the Crusades resulted in holy wars between Christians, Jews, and Muslims. In modern times, wars have been fought between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, and Jews and Arabs in the Middle East. However, common to all of this is a, is a struggle for power. It has nothing to do with God. Um, so I would absolutely agree with the atheists and others who say that their atrocious things have been done in the name of God, even in the name of Christianity. However, these atrocious things were not perpetrated by God but an evil human being. I'd like to respond to that. Okay. Maybe not perpetrated by God, but people believed in their God, and that's why they were doing these things of evil. It's just like you right now. You probably you probably voted yes on Prop 8. Is that right, Dave? I assume you did. Prop 8? I didn't vote, but go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Be patriotic, Dave. Be patriotic. Vote. This is one of the things that I uh, like to talk about, especially with people like uh, very astute people, with Dave and Doug, like Dave and Doug. People believe, and their behavior is dictated by their belief. What that means is that Christians vote yes on Prop 8. Eventually, the homosexual issue is going to be a dead issue in another 30 to 50 years, and we're going to look on it just like we did with interracial marriage or the women's rights to vote. All these things that are secular in nature, improving individual rights, every time it comes up throughout history, from slavery to suffrage and to interracial marriage and now to, to gays having more rights, the religious right has condemned the progress of this. This is the harm that is caused. If you have a child and you say, go to this abstinence program, you're actually giving them the opportunity to get pregnant more than if they didn't go to an abstinence program. That's harm because you don't know it's harmful. You trust your religious leaders. If you're religious, I think that 60% of you are religious, although I think that a whole group of 25 atheists just came in at the end. I'm kidding, guys. You're not atheists. You're probably 60 40. A lot of people came in. So this is the thing. People do harm without knowing it based on religious values. So they don't do the extensive harm that they used to do during the Crusades. But they do do harm in society, and that's why I'm an evangelogetic atheist. Can I respond to that? Yes, absolutely. Please do. Um, when we look through the history of democide, this includes genocide, policide, mass murder, just not wars, basically. Prior to the 20th century, we find that millions of people were killed by groups who wanted other people, groups, eliminated. Note that these murders do not include killing for wars. What percentage of these killings were due to religious homicide or democide? Less than 3%. And I've got the statistics right here from every country. China, Mongol, slavery, and African. And then you go back and look at the murders by atheists in the 20th century. Box Day and the Irrational Atheist list 22 atheistic regimes that committed 153,368,610 murders in the 20th century alone, and right through Afghanistan, through Vietnam. And I've got the statistics right here. That's the first time I've heard of that one. Yeah. I'd like to see those statistics, and I'd like to find out the atheistic viewpoint. Yeah, I'd just like to respond briefly. Uh, the student of history draws, above all, uh, two lessons from the 20th century totalitarianism. First, uh, dictators are bad, 
and second, psychopath dictators are very bad. Okay? <laughs> the problem is dictatorship, not atheism. Neither of these men nor the societies they led were overly influenced by reason and empathy, the foundations that I referred to earlier of secular morality. If you want to see atheism without dictatorship, as I said earlier, look at the modern day countries of Scandinavia or Japan. Uh, conversely, if you want to see dictatorship without atheism, look at modern day Iran. It's ruled by a supreme leader and a guardian council. Uh, political and human rights are curtailed. Women are oppressed, and any Muslim who's not a Shiite is in deep trouble. So the problem is dictatorship, uh, not atheism. And incidentally, uh, the situation in Iran is not much different from the way it was in most of Europe under Christianity until it was finally declawed by the Enlightenment. And then we have people like Charlotte Mai say, we communists are atheists, and then proceed to kill 60 million of his own people. Yes, but he killed the atheist as well. He did not raise the atheist flag. He raised the political dogmatic flag. Well, there is no atheist flag, right? I mean, well, I showed right, you one. It's a flag. We're talking. Well, yeah, but look, I mean, atheist. point taken. Point taken, Doug. There is no atheist right. flag. So, it's not that important. I mean, they're not going to be raising the flag that doesn't exist, right? But let's go back. Let, let's go back to Hitler. Okay, I mean, he was highly influenced by Charles Darwin. Mm. Oh, you got, you got a tough subject there, Doug. You, you brought up Hitler. Is, He's a Christian. True. Yeah. Christian. Isn't he a Christian? What? Well, he know, says look, so in three or you four of by, You should know them by their fruit, okay? So, uh, you know, here he was he was highly influenced by Charles Darwin. He uh, believed in eugenics. Now, eugenics actually started in America, That's unfortunately. Uh, but this, uh, he, that was his model. And then people were praising him. Here in America were actually praising him for actually carrying out the eugenics program. He was taking it to its next logical step. This is the survival of the fittest to get rid of the people that he didn't want. All right, so you can claim whatever he was, you know, as far as his label, you know, if he's Christian or not. Some, you know, maybe he was Jewish. There's, you know, talk about that. He was Catholic, actually. Well, Catholic. Look, look, I mean, I'm not going to beat around the bush. There were many churches in... Europe at that time, of course, Germany, that were turning a blind eye to what was happening. And it's pathetic. I mean, there's no question about it. Uh, then you have uh, people like uh, Bonhoeffer who actually stand up and he paid the ultimate price. He paid with his life. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there have not been cowards, uh, hypocrites, and just plain pagans who have occupied places in the church. Look, I, I lived in Europe for a number of years. I had a friend who was a Christian. Why was he a Christian? Because he paid taxes so that he could get a burial plot when he dies. All right, so that's what makes him a Christian. But he doesn't believe in God in the slightest. And yet he has the label of Christian. In fact, everybody in Germany is a Christian, for goodness sake. You know, but they're not Christians. And you see, just because they happen to have their place marked out so that when they die, they can be buried there, that doesn't make them a Christian. If you're not doing what Jesus told us to do, then you're not a Christian. It's very simple. Who's to know? Well, you know. Uh, I'd just like to comment on, on Hitler. I mean, he was certainly not an atheist. He spoke incessantly of God and providence, invoking either when it suited him, uh, especially when he was attacking his favorite targets, Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and socialists. By the way, that list should sound familiar. Those are the same enemies that Pat Robertson has. Hitler found it politically advantageous to play upon centuries of anti-Semitism created by Christianity, as exemplified by church leaders Tertullian, Eusebius, Augustine, and Martin Luther. Hitler inherited and continued the tradition of accusing the Jews of being God's enemies when he wrote in his book Mein Kampf, I believe that I am act acting in accordance with the will of the Almighty Creator by defending myself against the Jew. I am fighting for the work of the Lord. And one last tidbit. He could be saved if he converted on his deathbed. <coughs> so, Dave, Doug, Dave, Hitler could be in heaven right now. And I, I need to bring up one thing before. Uh, this is kind of a, a hypothetical. It's a, it's a thought experiment. It'll take you about a minute. And uh, let's say that a woman, let's see, is, are there any teenagers in here? Teenagers, very good. How old are you, ma'am? 16. 16. Let's say you. What's your name, ma'am? Jasmine, Jasmine, let's just suppose 
that you get involved in biology in high school. You grow up to be one of the best scientists in cancer research. You only save people that have breast cancer, and not only breast cancer, but a very particular part of breast cancer. Within your lifetime, you'll extend the lives of 100,000 people. You die, and 100 years later, that has grown to about 10 million. In 1,000 years, over a billion. You, ma'am, you saved a billion people, as I feel. You will be tortured in hell forever if you do not convert. This is the, the ridiculousness of Christianity. You, ma'am, did a, a noble thing, a, a moral thing, high integrity, tons of character, and you are going to be punished in hell because you don't believe a particular religion among all the other religions. On the other hand, Hitler, he's shaking hands with God right now. I'm exaggerating, but this is a good point. And the way to discover the truth is to exaggerate. If you follow the logical conclusion, you usually come up with the truth. I think I better stop there. Well, first of all, Jasmine is homeschooled, and she's a lot smarter than I am, probably. Than any of us. <laughs> she asks questions that nobody can answer. And yet, I, I do believe that hypothetical questions uh, don't usually don't usually happen, you know, as Doug said, you Good. know them by their fruits, and the fruits of what you just mentioned normally would be that which you would find in a Christian who would uh, do his best to uh, save others, help them in, in many ways, so, you know, there's a lot of things. People can benefit from uh, the lives of what you do, what I do, but that may not mean that they are saved necessarily. Salvation is something that's a free gift of God. It's not something that we can earn. If it be of works, it cannot be of faith. That's what's so wonderful about God. He's done all the work for us. All we need to do is believe in Him to receive Him as our personal Lord and Savior. Amazing. Yeah? Is it? Amazing. It is. it is, but usually it's by their fruit you'll know them because the fruit is the product of salvation, not the way to earn it. So most cults, most world religions outside of Christianity have a work system of salvation. Christianity is unique in the fact that God saves us the moment we believe. I think that we never lose that. Go ahead. Well, I think that everybody it's knows. Like you're born into a family. I think everybody knows that the theology behind that, you know, that this world is a temporary world, and there's another world afterward. But there's no evidence to that. That's strictly unbelief. We don't know that. You don't know that. Nobody knows if there's a heaven or a hell. I'm pretty sure there isn't, but nobody knows. Why believe in some, well, sorry for this deal again, why believe in an afterlife and behave in a particular way if you don't know that you're going there? Sorry. I'm sorry, did you guys want to respond to the story yeah. point? I just want to say one real quick thing. Um, you don't know when you're not in love, but you do know when you are. And you don't know when you're not safe, but you do know when you are. And you don't oh, know when someone else is not safe, safe usually, but you know when they when they are. And there is something about that. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. We cry out of Father. There's something that when a person becomes a Christian, all of a sudden his spirit, he, he knows it. There was one pastor who was sharing with a woman, are you saved? Are you going to heaven? She said, well, I hope so. I think so. Or I, I, I sure hope so. And he led her to receive Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. And then he tried just for fun. He says, I'm going to try to convince her that she's not a Christian. And he couldn't do it. Because somehow the Spirit of God came within her and she understood. She had that inner knowledge, something that Christians can understand. <coughs> An unbeliever probably hasn't had that experience, so wouldn't know that. I'm sure that... I'm sorry. I'm stealing Bill's time. I own the dessert afterward for, for dinner. <laughs> I, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Did I jump in? I, I, uh, my mind's going a million now, a miles an hour. One thing that we forgot to tell Greg, and I have to do this today, right now, because uh, we won't have time later. If you enjoy these type of debates, sign up for our email list. We will share it with Dave and Doug, and so you'll probably receive two different emails. I'm going to start over here. And that does say, are you religious or non-religious? You don't have to fill that out, but I'd like to. Okay, Bill, now it's your turn. 
No, no, I just wanted to follow up. Yes, yeah, there yeah. response on this. You know, uh, Louis Pasteur was ridiculed for believing in things he could not see. Uh, the whole idea that there were germs, little things that were down there that they just couldn't see. People ridiculed him for that, but he kept on pressing on, believing that they really were there until he finally proved it, and as a result, we're all now benefiting. So, you know, to say that there's something that you cannot see, you see, in your worldview, you have excluded certain data from your paradigm, and you said that anything that is not material, that is, something that is spiritual, cannot be submitted uh, as part of the evidence. Now, there, now, I can't take you and show you physically things that are spiritual, because that would be a contradiction. But there is great amount of testimony by many, many people, and not all Christians. I don't mean to tell you that it's all Christian. There are people uh, who are into shamanism, who have real experiences that they, uh, they see beings beyond. Uh, people that have taken LSD have also talked about seeing uh, creatures, some kind of beings that are beyond the veil. And yet, in your worldview, you, you absolutely reject that because you say, unless I can see it, touch it, smell it, uh, et cetera, or measure it, then it does not exist. So the God that created everything that Dave so eloquently uh, gave you uh, more than enough data to actually believe, not blindly, but uh, with good reason, he does exist. He's given us a lot of evidence that we can see, and there are also many things that we cannot see with our senses. We can't see with our eyes or touch them. They're not tactile. But they do exist nevertheless. Now, I've never seen George Washington personally, but I've read about him. I've seen some pictures of him. I think the guy actually existed. Just a hunch. But I can't actually take you and show you uh, with empirical evidence that, yes, George Washington really existed. But do I have reason to doubt it? Many people saw him. We have his, his testimonies, we have his memoirs. Uh, we can go and see where he lived. We can do the same thing uh, with Jesus, for example. We can go back even further. We can see King David, uh, all the people that are spoken of in the Bible. We can go and we can discover something about them. You can go to Israel, you can go on a tour, you can go to Jehoshaphat's tomb, you can go to David's tomb. There are many things that you can go and see, like, wow, these were real people, these are not just fairy tales. So the Bible is historically accurate. And if it's historically accurate, and then we begin to see that it's prophetically accurate, <laughs> there is good reason to believe that the God that is described in there is true. And of course, it always does bring us back to the question of origins. Just how did we get here, you guys? Uh, you know, when it talks, you talk about, um, you know, uh, be believing by faith, and you're not supposed to ask questions. Uh, that is exactly what the stranglehold on our scientific uh, uh, institutions is doing. Uh, you can watch the movie uh, Expel. Uh, it does a very good job of showing you how people that are questioning the paradigm of evolution are not being given a fair shake. In fact, they're being kicked out of those institutions of higher learning. If we're truly seeking knowledge, we're seeking the truth, then why not throw that in there? And why not discuss that so that we can come up with an even better reason for evolution, if that really is the case? So I guess we're not going to address the slavery issue. Uh, I would like to uh, come back. Uh, uh, my esteemed colleagues here have mentioned uh, evidence, the fact that Louis Pasteur uh, was a pioneer in the germ theory of medicine. Uh, that's good for him. Um, but uh, there are some very uh, clear falsifiable assertions that Christianity makes. Uh, Christianity teaches that through, through prayer, Christians can cause their God to do things that he would not otherwise do. Uh, Mark 11, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Uh, Matthew 21, if you believe you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Uh, these are strange promises. I mean, first of all, wouldn't an omniscient deity already know what people want. Second, shouldn't a fair deity do what's fair, irrespective of a person's petitions? And finally, what happens if equally without people pray for contradictory things? Uh, the French Christians prayed for victory against the Germans. The German Christians prayed for victory against the French. 
Um, why uh, does why is God not able to restore the limb of an amputee? Uh, there are many amputees, many of them um, devout Christians, prayerful Christians. Uh, while many Christians claim to have been cured by a cure of ambiguous or vague illnesses, I personally don't know of any instance of uh, an arm or a leg uh, being uh, restored uh, to the prayerful. And again, salamanders and iguanas who lose tails to predators are routinely able to regrow them. It doesn't seem like it would be too much of a stretch for the creator of the cosmos to restore an arm, an arm or a leg. So I put that to you. Is, is that something that you would agree disconfirms Christianity? Well, the apostles were able to. We need some sound here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we went from apostolic authority to biblical authority, and one of the apostolic, the apostolic gifts were miracles. They were able to do things, and we see this in Second Corinthians 12, 12. The signs of the apostle are these signs, wonders, miracles. And so somebody got healed from Paul's handkerchief or Peter's shadow, things that would be obviously not seen today. And there's a reason for that. In Ephesians 4, 11, we talk about the, that God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to the church. Now we see in Paul's third missionary journey, we see that picture in, in Romans 12, we don't see these apostolic sign gifts. Now why not? Because if you believe not me, believe the works that I do. God still heals today. He still does. I don't know, you know, amputees is not the one that I've seen, but people can, do. Can I heal. interrupt you right there? Yeah, Dave? sure. Do you think that Christian prayers are answered more than Muslim prayers? In the positive things? Yes. Do you think that, the, that they're answered more than any other uh, false god, as you would say, prayers? Like yes. uh, Hindu? Definitely. Why then, in the entire world, are people healed equally no matter what their religion? You walk into any equal hospital in the world with anything, with any illness, no matter what religion you are, you get healed equally. Now just imagine if Christian scientists walk in the hospital, oh, I'm ill, I have pneumonia. Oh, the nurse says, you'll be out of here on 30% less than everybody else because you're a Christian scientist. What would happen? What would happen? There would be billions of dollars trying to figure out what makes these Christian scientists different. But no, we don't see that. We don't see prayer happening. Dave, your prayers are not answered. And if they are, they're answered the same as everybody else's, every other religion and the atheist's hope. Because when we go in a hospital, we hope that that doctor has his shit together. Because that's the only thing we can hope for. We do not pray. I know this for a fact. There's been 42 prayer studies in the last 52 years. And all of them except two, which were, um, I think the right word, neutral, all of them, the control group, had the exact same prayers answered the same as the prayer group did. 48 studies, Dave, including many that are done by the, by the, um, Templeton. Templeton, thank you very much. <clears throat> right, Templeton study, which is, a, that was a $2 million study. There's several books out that George Mueller, actually, this is documented, he wanted to show the world that God answered prayer. So he started an orphanage with no, in other words, he, he, he told his people that gave him money to give it to some other, other source. He wanted to be able to show the world that God answered prayer. So he started an orphanage on nothing. And he, he kept a daily log. And they would be sitting down at a table and they'd pray for the food they didn't have. Somebody knocked on the door and handed a basket of food. He needed three bags of flour. He prayed the next morning and walked out. There's three bags of flour on the doorstep. I mean, it was just daily, that sort of thing. We, we have a lot of that. Evidence and that doesn't happen in other religions? No. <laughs> Let me just follow up with that. It says in uh, James 4, 3, uh, James 4, 2 and 3, You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses... Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? So many times we ask for things, it's true, 
we don't get them. We say, well, why, what's wrong with God? Why didn't he give me that thing? And very often it's because I'm asking for my own self. Now, what's so interesting is that you know people walking by and touching Paul's handkerchief could be healed. Uh, and yet, when Paul prayed for himself that this something, whatever he calls a thorn of the flesh, we don't know what that was, he wasn't healed of it. And he says that he prayed three times and he wasn't healed of whatever that infirmity was. Now it's also interesting, going back to the book of Jeremiah, uh, God was sending the prophet Jeremiah to the, the rebellious people, telling them to repent, and they did not. So after so many times that he told them, until eventually God said, don't pray for them any longer. Don't pray for them. He said that three times in the book of Jeremiah. Don't pray for them. So there, there, there are some stipulations. And it's not that we're going to you know, suddenly twist God's arm and he has to do things. Uh, he remains righteous. Uh, for example, he said that he could destroy the Jewish people after they, uh, he brought them out of Egypt. And then they, they uh, bowed down to the golden calf. And he said, I'll just start over. Moses, I'll start with you. And Moses interceded for them, and he actually changed history. You're talking about the Moses who brought down the Ten Commandments? That's St. Moses? That's St. Moses. And right when he came down, he saw these people worshiping, and he killed 3,400 people. Is that the same Moses? Yeah, 3,000. Okay, got it. Good red light. Okay. Oh, close. <laughs> Are we going somewhere, Greg? Just we're getting close to, I think, wrapping up our open discussion, and we'll okay. need to move to closing statements here shortly.